In this week's photo breakdown, I'm gonna walk you through this shot, the lighting diagram, and exactly how it was shot. There's also a couple of little surprises in there that you won't be aware of. Let's see if you can figure them out. Okay, let's give you a good look at the image to see if you can decipher exactly how it was shot, lit, and the other techniques as well. So let's zoom in, let's take a look at what we've got. We have the beautiful Santa Ozina uh, modeling for me here. This was shot in Iceland as part of a project that we did called Fashionscape, where we spent about a week traveling around Iceland, shooting landscapes, shooting fashion in landscapes. We documented the whole thing. If you'd like to see it, it's over on our education platform. But let's look at this image again in more detail. So take a look at the lighting, take a look at the background, take a look at the scenery, take a look at the exposure of the sky, and take a look at the look of the lighting on the dress and uh, the sharpness, etc., of the model and what's going on here. A couple of little giveaway clues. You can see a little bit of edge fringing um, from ambient light combined with uh, high-speed flash. Um, and then you can see uh, on this side, uh, that isn't so much of a problem here. We've managed to capture her frozen. There's a tiny little bit of fringing there. And this occurs when you're trying to combine flash with bright continuous daylight and um, the shutter speeds necessary to overcome this. Um, so you can end up with this very small amount of fringing. It's very minor in this case, and it can be retouched out, but quite often I actually like to leave it there because I find it gives a sort of nice atmosphere, if you like, to, uh, to the image. Now, take a look at the lighting. What do you think is going on? Well, it's fairly obvious, isn't it, that uh, the brightest light you can see here hitting the leg on this side, hitting the dress on this side, up the chest, the neck, and the side of the face. So clearly that lighting is coming in from my camera right hand side um, to the model. But what about the left hand side of the model? What about the lighting in there? That is not complete shadow, it's not dark. There is of course some lighting getting in there on the leg and that side of the body. And then of course we have the exposure for the background as well. So we have to consider the exposure for the sky, the exposure for the land, and how that all combines with our studio flashlighting on location. Now, some of you may be confused by the term studio flashlighting, um, but studio flashlighting can be used on location because you can use battery powered studio flashlighting as well. In this case, we were using the Broncolor Move Packs with the lithium batteries, um, allowing us to use lighting on location. So let's move over to the lighting diagram. Now, um, I've just put the image over on the left for us to refer to, but let's start off here. Um, what I've got here is those squiggly lines represent the background hills, which you can see behind our subject here. They were about a kilometer away behind us. So let's move through the shot, our model here, and then the dress that the model is wearing, flowing behind over to camera left. Now, one of the things you may not have realized is this, and that was a trampoline. The model was bouncing on a trampoline to get the elevation necessary to get it in the air, because I wanted that authenticity in terms of the feeling of her sort of being pulled up into the sky. The actual name of the shot, I titled it as uh, Ascension. Um, and I really wanted to get that sort of atmosphere. So we actually had the model jumping, bouncing on a trampoline, and she did a wonderful job with the uh, poses necessary for the final result there. Now, the dress, as you can see, is flowing off really well to camera left, and that was because we had this. 
We had these ice cold winds coming down from another mountainside that was actually covered in snow. That's how cold it was out there. And those strong winds were doing the job of like a giant wind machine and they were blowing the dress for us perfectly over to camera left. Here's my camera and my camera was quite high. So um, it was probably about half a meter higher than uh, head height or a meter higher. Um, so uh, higher than my normal shooting uh, position, if I remember correctly. And then over here on this side was the key light and that was a Para 88. And that was throwing light in like so which was that key lighting that we looked at down the side of the model and down the side of the body and the dress. And the reason I was using the Para 88 is one, it's a wonderful modifier, but two, it can actually throw the light a long distance uh, because of the way that it collimates and focuses that light. We can actually utilize the Para 88 from some distance away, which meant I could keep it out of my shot, given that I've got quite a wide shot because I'm trying to incorporate some of the landscape in there as well. The next light was just another Para 88 as a fill light coming in from the left. However, the Para 88 fill glow was obviously a lot less, so it was half a stop, uh, probably one stop less exposure uh, yeah, more like one stop less exposure on this side. So all we're doing is ratioing the lights. So the key light was a sort of backlight key light. That one was one stop brighter than my fill light and I'm exposing correctly for that key light. And then just letting that light on my left side uh, do a little bit of fill work in there. If you put both lights at the same power, you're gonna end up with a very flat looking image because the lighting will be even on both sides and then you lose three dimensionality, you lose form and shape. So you always really wanna have some sort of form and shape because we're dealing with two dimensional images. You're trying to make them look three dimensional. So by ratioing the lights so that uh, one key light is stronger and then the other light fades away uh, gives you that three dimensionality back. Now, the interesting thing here is if we go back to the lighting diagram, these are the things you might not have figured out was here we have a filter on the lens and that was a graduated filter. Now that graduated filter was to darken the sky down. If we hadn't have used the graduated filter, we would have got the land at the correct exposure as you can see here, but the sky would have been uh, a little bit bright. Now the land was very dark in this case because it's a sort of volcanic ash surface. So that was absolutely fine. But these clouds, I wanted them to look a little bit more ominous and a little bit more dark and have a little bit more um, threatening presence to them. So to do that, we put on, I think it was either a two stop or a three stop graduated filter. The sort of soft graduation diffuses away. Now in doing that, you're obviously blocking some of the exposure on your model from your key light, which in this case was the light coming from the back on my right. So all we do is intentionally angle that light up slightly and then basically the um, main exposure is hitting the upper part of the model and then it's not affected so much by the graduation. And again, the graduation, the flash studio lighting, you don't really have to worry about the graduated filter on that because you're only using the graduated filter to control the ambient light on the sky. You can increase the power on the studio light to compensate for the loss of light through the graduated filter so you can get that back to whatever you need it to, as long as you've got enough power on your lights. And this is again, another reason why I don't use a light meter because, you know, putting the graduated filter in, out, etc., dealing with ambient light, really just looking at the shot, analyzing it and saying, right, you know what? I need another stop more on that light. Just like a volume control up and down with your lighting power in the same way you don't use an audio meter to measure how loud you want for your music system. System. So it's just basically done by eye using your eyes as a light meter. 
So once I'd worked out my exposure for the sky and the land with the graduated filter and I'd assessed that exposure, I was then able to add the lighting into that and adjust it to suit. Then the other key part of the shot was the trampoline. And the trampoline actually was in the image like so in the actual shot that I was taking because I couldn't get the model to jump high enough above the trampoline that I could move into a position where the trampoline would not be in the shot. So we made the decision to shoot on a tripod. So the camera's fixed, locked down. We let our model do the jumps and the poses over and over again. And as long as she cleared the trampoline, uh, and the dress cleared the trampoline, then I was happy. Because once I saw the shot or the pose that I wanted and I could uh, identify that that had been captured, then I simply asked our model to leave the set and our assistants moved the trampoline out of the shot, camera's still locked in position, and we just take another comping shot as a layer to bring into Photoshop and then we can rub through with a mask to eliminate and remove that trampoline from the shot. And then we end up with the final image like so. Now, if you'd like to watch that full shoot, plus all of the others from that project called Fashionscape in Iceland, they're all available on Carl Taylor Education, along with hundreds and hundreds of other classes. Thanks very much for watching.